All right, well, thank you, Denise, for having me. Um, I'm going to um, I'm going to start this talk with a, a story, and it's a story that actually got um, the Long Now Foundation, where I work, started. And it was um, a story of these beams. And um, the beams at New College Oxford were, were put in in the 1200s when the college was built. And um, it wasn't until 500 years later when uh, these beams needed to be replaced and the school didn't know quite what to do because you couldn't buy trees like this anymore in Europe. And it wasn't until they spoke to the school forester who said, well, we have the trees that you planted. And, um, and you know, this kind of simple act of uh, acorns being spread on the ground and then um, also having the kind of uh, organizational continuity to remember that you, they had done this, this process so that you could solve this uh, intractable problem by leveraging longevity uh, through you know five centuries. It was this kind of thinking that uh, when this story was first told to um, our our founders, uh, Danny Hillis and Stuart Brand, um, that realized that this kind of thinking wasn't happening anymore. And Danny Hillis had spent his uh, earliest years working uh, on a, basically the fastest supercomputers in the world out of MIT and then with his company, uh, Thinking Machines. And so he had always been kind of pushed to do things faster and faster. And, and Stuart Brand, who had, uh, who had started the Whole Earth Catalog back in the 60s and has been an author and technology pundit since, um, realized that uh, that in these kind of stories and and in getting our attention around uh, some longer term thinking and and understanding some of the things that you can only solve on a on a on a long time span such as climate change or hunger um, or education all of these things um, require kind of bearing down on over over generations and in some cases centuries or even thousands of years to truly solve and and this conversation sprung up among who became the, the founding board including brian eno who coined this term the long now when he he moved from uh england to to new york he realized that when people said now in new york they meant a very different thing uh than when they said now in in england and they in england they meant kind of the current time that we are in not the five minutes that we're in so he called he used this term the long now which we've uh, adopted and all the the people that really started long now, um, like Danny and Stewart and and uh, people like Esther Dyson and Kevin Kelly, they were really part of the early wave of um, of the digital culture here coming out of California, and um, and we're seeing some of the pitfalls of only fetishizing speed, and that if we were going to solve some of these larger world problems, we needed to have some kind of balancing corrective around this. And so, Danny um, thought that a kind of uh, basically building the slowest computer rather than the fastest computer uh, might be an interesting uh, kind of icon as a way of focusing people on the longer term. And so he had this idea of a, of a millennial clock that would tick once a year and bong once a century and the cuckoo would come out once a millennium built at a large enough scale that people, you know, would have to kind of confront it and it could be part of storytelling and myth building. And Stuart Brand loved that idea, but also thought there should be an information com component around it, basically a library on the same order, it's kind of millennial scale library. And then the conversation really started around it. And, and one of the first questions was, you know, what is the time scale that we should be pushing for? What is the right kind of human moment? We wanted to push it further than, um, you know, your average five-year plan, obviously. But if you you know if you're using infinite time scales or even astronomic time scales like this you're in the kind of billions of years which is really dwarfing to the human experience or even geologic time scales of millions of years um, is also very dwarfing to the human experience so this idea of um of looking at the last and next 10,000 years uh, became the the thought is that basically the last ice age retreated about 8,000 bc first cities um, started coming not long after that, but this was really the human kind of technological moment. And, um, and I think the most important thing about this diagram here is, is this idea that not only are we, um, you know, it's not just that we are at the end of a 10,000 year story, we are in the middle of a 20,000 year story. We have at least as much time in front of us in this human moment as we do behind us. And I, mean, I think we often are thinking about ourselves as kind of the end game rather than um, 
having this much time in front of us and 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 how would we would make decisions differently if we th were thinking about the next 10,000 years as much as the last. And when I first started at Long Now, um, I worked on this diagram with uh, that came out of a conversation with uh, Stuart Brand and Brian Eno, trying to kind of tease apart these layers of uh, time called the pace layers. And um, you know, on the very outside layers, uh, fashion and uh, even communications technology may be out there now at this point, um, most frenetic and fastest layers, and then coming down through commerce and infrastructure and governance and culture, and then nature moving the slowest and batting last but you know looking at the way that maybe um you might make a decision and how it affects all of these layers if you're if you are uh, a company or even a person um you know, for instance, when um, when Maxam Corporation uh, was, which was a company that basically bought companies for their assets and would sell the assets um, for more than they bought the company for, um, they they did that with a lot of kind of human-based companies. Um, but at one point, they bought Pacific Lumber, and when they bought Pacific Lumber, the assets of that of that company obviously were um, old growth redwoods. And so they were worth more than the company. And so they started just chopping them down and selling them in a, in a highly unsustainable way. And so they had basically, they had skipped, you know, they, they were working out here on this commerce layer and they had skipped all of these layers and were basically cutting something down that's on this nature layer that uh, could not be replaced in thousands and thousands of years, if ever. And um, and then all of a sudden, governance systems got upset, cultural systems got upset, infrastructure systems got upset. And then they eventually, a lot of these trees were protected, some were cut down. Um, but it was it's a good example of how if you skip a lot of these layers, you can kind of you can kind of upset the the balance of um, of how we move through time and the kind of pace layering of human time. And so I mentioned this clock, this uh, millennial clock, and it eventually became the 10,000 year clock. And, and I came on uh, back in 1997 to work with Danny Hillis to start building this uh, monument scale, um, all mechanical clock that could last for 10,000 years. And, and I'll just kind of just give you a quick window into the type of problems that we solve uh, when working on this. Um, and I'll also show you the current state of the construction as well. Um, but this picture here is um, is what's called the analemma. You might have seen it drawn on on globes out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. But what this represents is uh, is a, this is a picture of uh, the sun taken at uh, high. At, at its highest point in the sky throughout the course of a year, and it makes this shape. Um, so the solstices are at the end, the equinoxes is where they cross over. Um, but there's this thing that happens here is that that, that space um, between the, um, the sun picture or sun images there represents about a plus or minus 15 minute difference of uh, basically where solar noon is versus absolute noon. So since our clock does two things, it keeps track of the sol solar noon as well as absolute time. So we have a pendulum that's keeping absolute time or clock time. And then we have uh, a lens that focuses sunlight uh, into a part of the clock that expands um, some material and gives us a mechanical trigger that says this is solar noon. So because of this plus or minus 15 minute difference, we would actually be correcting the clock incorrectly um, at certain times of the year. So what we, and, and the, normally you would solve this with uh, just a two dimensional cam that had this kind of pattern in it. Um, but since we're building a 10,000 year clock, we also have to keep track of the processional cycle, which is almost a 26,000 year cycle of the earth wobbling on its axes. And uh, the earth uh, is also slowing its rotational rate currently by about a second per century. And all of those things um, had to be taken into account over the next 10,000 years. And, and that meant that we had to make a three-dimensional cam that turned around once per year that gave us this equation of time, this plus or minus 15 minutes, but that the, um, the follower arm would move up that over the course of uh, over of 10,000 years. We also added 1,000 years on the top and the bottom so that we have a little bit of time to replace this uh, at the end of its life. Uh, but that's just a, an example of the kind of problem that we had to solve uh, when building the 10,000-year clock. 
And the clock itself is not complete yet, but this is the site that we're building at. Um, the, the clock project is funded by Jeff Bezos. Um, and this is a uh, property out near where uh, one of his uh, launch facilities are out in West Texas, uh, high desert uh, karst limestone formation. Um, but we, we knew that we wanted to work underground um, and to make this thing last. And we wanted this kind of experience that people would hike up and and enter in to the uh, the site in almost like a old mine or an, even a natural cave looking setting. They'd go through the whole clock site and then be come out at the top um, after seeing the clock and and having maybe being there for one of those synchronization solar synchronization moments. Um, and you'd leave through a much more um, uh, man made type of uh, type of environment and. and just again to kind of give you one example of the type of problems that we solved on this project we wanted to work uh in the negative in rock uh basically and kind of by carving it um, but there really aren't good tools for that um right now and and um, the only thing that was close was the way that they cut marble out of carrara uh italy um, with these giant uh, diamond chainsaws and um, or band saws um, and so we actually got one of those and um, adapted the blade it's a nine foot diamond belt uh, belt blade that um, that we then could cut out uh, these parts of the stairs and then break the the plates of rock out in between them and then what we were left with was uh, these kind of beautifully carved stairs where actually the stairs taper from the bottom of the site to the top. So every single cut was different. So it would, it would not have worked um, as a human operate, human cut operation. So this, this robot uh, ran for two years cutting uh, 300 feet of stairs for us. And, um, and then just getting to the actual parts of the clock itself. Um, one of the most recently installed parts on the clock is the chime generator, which uh, can ring a series of 10 bells in a different sequence each day for 10,000 years. And so there's these 10 bells that we had specially engineered um, to ring in um, a kind of an octave lower than their normal size. And then this mechanism is probably the, the largest single mechanism within the clock. It's about 80 feet tall and 60,000 pounds. Uh, mostly of stainless steel. The, the bells themselves are a special type of bronze. Uh, most of the axles uh, in the clock are made out of titanium and then all of the bearings in the clock are made uh, of solid ceramics with no lubrication. There's not, uh, there's no place in the clock where we use lubrication because it simply couldn't last long enough uh, for for that use. Um, and this, this install happened um, before COVID hit. Um, so we've been slowed down by installation on the site, but we're still working on finishing the last parts of the clock that will show you the dials and, and have that parts like the solar synchronization that I mentioned before. And that's where we are with the clock. Um, we're nearing completion on it, but not quite there yet. Um, and I mentioned uh, at the beginning also this idea of, um, of a library. Um, and, and this is a, a when Stuart mentioned this idea of a library. The first projects that we started thinking about is like, when you're talking about a 10,000 year library, you know, it's not just platform dependence of like digital data or, um, or even um, the print medium, but actually it gets down to language, right? Um, we, you know, things like the Rosetta Stone showed us that, you know, even only a, a few thousand years, you can lose whole languages and scripts and not understand how to reinterpret them. Luckily, this object was found by one of Napoleon's soldiers and after a 50 year decoding effort gave us uh, much more insight into hieroglyphics. Um, but we thought we'd make a modern version of the Rosetta Stone as kind of a disc that's kind of has information as dense as some of our digital storage medium, um, or at least in that in that magnitude, um, but that uh, could last for thousands of years and be read with much lower technology. And so we created this uh, disc called the Rosetta disc, where one side of it um, kind of gives you a key and tells you what's on it um, and a list of languages. And the other side had uh, nearly 15,000 pages of micro etched uh, data that was etched in, this was created with a gallium ion beam, similar to um, how we make uh, prototype circuits. But instead of writing circuits, we wrote uh, actual text. And then uh, these thousands and thousands of pages of, of text can uh, 
can be read with a microscope. So kind of 17th century technology can read this and it gives us access to over 1500 languages instead of just the, um, the, the two languages and three scripts that was on the original Rosetta Stone, but hopefully should be able to last as long. And one of these uh, early prototypes of the Rosetta disk that we created was launched on the ESA's Rosetta mission and was on the, the orbiter um, that uh, arrived at the uh, comet 10 years later. This is now uh, back in 2014 that it landed um, and continues to orbit uh, the sun about every six and a half years to this day. And so those are the projects, uh, the kind of two main core projects at Long Now. We have other projects around uh, betting uh, of, of things of long-term science and consequence uh, called Long Bets. We have spun off projects like Revive and Restore where um, using, uh, designing ways of using genetic engineering for bringing back extinct species. But these, uh, the Rosetta project and the clock project were our two first core projects. And maybe um, Denise and I can get into some of the other projects um, after this talk, I'd be happy to talk about them. Um, but one of the most recent areas of research that I'm working on is trying to figure out um, you know, how the longest lived institutions have stayed around. And, you know, as you look through these lists of the oldest uh, companies and universities in the world, you, know, you start to see some, some trends in here where it's like, first of all, a lot of them are in Japan. Um, second of all, many of them are breweries and confectionaries and, and kind of these um, and, and family run hotels uh, things like that. And then uh, universities show up around 1000 AD um, and obviously have, have stayed with us ever since. Um, but trying to understand, you know, in some cases, some of these um, some of these institutions are, have very unportable reasons for why they've stayed around. Like if you're the Royal Confectioner of Japan, you have one customer and that customer has survived, so it worked out. Um, but um, I'm kind of more interested in potentially some of these um, construction companies or, or other things that have also lasted. But I think it is it's worth knowing that um, some of the oldest companies in the world are, are all in this kind of interesting service industry of food and beverage, um, which makes sense because it's kind of universal, universal needs. Um, the other uh, thing that's interesting is coming up in the research is, is really just how, um, how sh much shorter the lifespan of uh, the Fortune 500 companies has become. And basically we're, we're losing almost one year per year um, of life in the Fortune 500, and so you know, back in um, 1950, uh, average Fortune 500 company was 61 years old, and now it's down to actually it's even less than this now. This is is a little bit out of date, but um, it's uh, less than 18 years now. Uh, but again, some of the oldest ones here uh, in the Fortune 500, most of them are in. Um, uh, services, uh, in this case, mostly financial ones. And then as you really start looking over the lists of some of the oldest companies, for instance, the uh, companies that are over 200 years old, as I mentioned, um, vast majority are in Japan. Um, and um, the other interesting thing that came up is really something about scale, which um, I think is probably a really important component of how things last. Obviously, if you're if your only model for how your company or your software or um, or anything is is growth um, and and your only gauge for success is growth then at some point you're gonna you're gonna max out and so it's interesting to me that um, you know 90 percent of the companies that are over 200 years old have less than 300 uh, employees these are not huge companies and and a huge percentage of even that really only have you know less than 10 or 20. Um, and you know, getting back to this, you know, what what type of organization survive? It's these uh, these kind of key components of of uh, of of human experience of coming together. Um, you know, sake, beer, wine, hotels, restaurants. Um, these are these are all the kind of things that humans have to do, no matter how long uh, the company is around. And. What we start to find out is not only how objects and companies or organizations last. Um, you know, there's a few devices that have that have that have worked over time, and uh, you know, one of them uh, is the idea of you know, first, you, if if something is lost um, and out of the 
the the zeitgeist for a long time or not known about for a long time and then found at the right moment it's actually a good strategy sometimes for the way things can last and this is a picture of the antikythera device which was found at the bottom of the mediterranean in a shipwreck um, off of greece and it wasn't until um, a lot of uh, kind of x-rays and stuff were, were done on this that we are now able to basically rebuild this as an astronomical kind of clock of sorts, or at least an astronomical display of sorts. Um, and um, that's kind of, for us, it's you know, one of the reasons why we're building the clock mechanical. One is that it's kind of more, I think, interesting and dramatic to make things mechanical than electronic. But also, you know, if, if it was an electronic clock that was found at the bottom of the Mediterranean 2000 years ago, um, you would, it would be very difficult for you to understand its intent and, you know, in the silicon and, uh, and discrete circuitry, what it was meant to do. Whereas mechanics, even just a few pieces of that gave us a lot of insight into how that thing worked. Um, also making things really remote, as you saw the site that we have for the clock is, is quite remote. This is a picture I took at the, um, the global seed vault in Svalbard. It's designed to last for a thousand years. It has, uh, it's a repository of uh, the world's um, crop seeds. Um, and I think what's also interesting about remoteness, it's, it's helpful for lasting long. You're not in this churn of cities and things like that, but also it's, it kind of creates its own um, kind of mythic quality. I was, I was, this is the, the guest book that I signed at this, at the seed vault. Um, you know, it's, it's 800 miles north of the, the most northern part of Norway up in an archipelago. And, um, and I was signing my name after Ban Ki-moon and Jimmy Carter and all these other dignitaries and people have flown all the way to this corner of the earth just to see this, um, this, the seed vault. And, um, and so there's something about it, that remoteness that, um, that also can create um, a mythic quality that helps things survive. Um, the other th way to last for a really long time is just to take a really long time to build build the thing that you're working on. Uh, cathedrals are famous for this. This cathedral in Cologne uh, was started in 1248 and wasn't considered finished until 1880. Um, you know, you, the cathedral, the Sagrada Familia, and that. Uh, Gaudi was one of the architects of, um, is now on its third architect. It's 125 years into its build process um, and is already considered a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which I think is interesting um, that something that's under construction and not even completed could be considered a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but it seems to be on a good path to be preserved for quite a long time. And in uh, Japan, we have some of the greatest examples of maintenance uh, in the world, and these are um, these are two of the oldest continuously standing wooden buildings in the world, um, and they um, they actually were does, they were part of the Buddhist. Uh, tradition that came into Japan um, that kind of got layered on top of Shintoism actually produced at this um, this site. Um, I just got this. Uh, it's kind of an amazing thing. It's an interesting story of, of digital preservation or of, of information preservation as well. Um, at this site, uh, a prince, the princess who founded this site in 760 AD had a vision um, that she was supposed to um, preserve a prayer for, um, for eternity. And so what she did is she commissioned, um, she commissioned a million of these pagodas to be turned in, on wood lathes and, and then uh, coated in this gold leaf. And then the, 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 uh, the prayer is on, the, is on the, the paper inside there and is curled up tight. And since these were made in 760 AD, a million of them, they're still floating around. And uh, we had just found this one on eBay. And, uh, and one of our board members was nice enough to bid on it and get it for us. So it's gonna be part of our displays um, at our place in San Francisco, but it just came in and it's, uh, it's an interesting, you know, it's the, there's that principle of how you store, how you keep information um, over time is called locks. Lots of copies keep stuff safe. And I, that's, I've only had heard of it in terms of digital terms, but it's interesting to see how um, well it played out in physical terms. Um, also in Japan, not long, not far from that site is a Shinto site where they, uh, they have been rebuilding um, the Shinto temple in an exact replica of itself in alternating sites. This is a rare picture here taken uh, back when uh, I was there for the last rebuilding um, and they, they take down one, uh, one whole temple and after building up uh, the next one in 20 years. And it takes them uh, a 
about eight years to build the, the temples themselves. But I, what's interesting about this one, I think also is an interesting example for digital information is that this is kind of basically our strategy for how we how we keep digital information around for a long time now. Um, you know, it gets stored on big mag tapes or other media that then, you know, every somewhere between five and 20 years, we have to forward migrate that. And uh, it's both the most dangerous time for that media um, or that information because a human error could overwrite something or not recover it correctly. Um, but it's also the time where we kind of check the information, see if it's relevant. The next technology hopefully is much better than the one that we're coming from. Um, and in Japan, I think this is interesting because every 20 years you have this uh, kind of generational shift where the person who is the, the junior um, person building this, uh, this temple is now going to be the senior person of the 20 years later after having that experience. And so this generational reminding of why, of, of what, why you're doing it in the Shinto tradition, as well as um, how to do it uh, is interesting. And then the, another example of how things have lasted is really through continual refresh. This is the university at Bologna, the oldest university we know of. And, um, and this idea that uh, a new class comes in every single year and graduates every four years or so um, is new energy. It's young people coming into it. Um, and then the universities it's themselves kind of have to sell themselves to that generation um, as they go forward. So I think there's a good symbiosis there, both fresh energy as well as um, having, you know, knowing that you have a different, uh, the people are changing over the years if you're going to stay relevant as a university. Um, another uh, another interesting one to me is this idea, and I think it's very relevant to the open source uh, world, is that we have many examples of things that um, that have lasted for millennia that are not because of uh, a top-down structure, but more because of a community of practice. And uh, martial arts are a great example. Um, you know, yoga is a good example, um, and and even you know some games like chess and things like that. I would say are good examples. Um, but certainly, this is um, the path that a lot of things like um, like open source software seem to be on. Is how do you make a community of practice that allows something to last and grow, but um, but kind of retain its core? Um, and the last one I'll mention is this interesting one that keeps coming up in nature is this idea that adversity breeds longevity. And some of the basically things that you find in nature in the most extreme environments tend to be the, lo the longest living. This is a picture of bristlecone pine. Um, it's one of the, or it's the oldest uh, continuously living single species in the world. Um, some of these trees are dated to over 5,000 years old. And, and actually this idea of adversity breeds longevity um, po was postulated uh, because they started seeing that the pine trees that were in the worst environments um, were, the, long, were the, the oldest ones that they were coring. And so uh, the, a person said in a paper that if you could find a conifer that was in the, the most difficult environment you could find, that uh, you would find the oldest conifer species. And so in fact, they went up into the White Mountains and mountains in Nevada and found these trees based on that principle and found uh, these trees that were older by several thousand years than anything else had been dated in the world. And I think, you know, just the other kind of things to keep in mind as we're looking forward, um, and if we're, if any of us are trying to build things that are going to last a long time, you know, we, uh, there's a, there's going to be a changing world over the next hundred years in both demographics and climate. Um, you know, this is just showing uh, some of the agricultural, where the agricultural years are going to be getting better as climate change happens. I think it's interesting to see that you know, countries like um, the United States, Canada, and Russia are kind of going to be uh, winners, as well as some of the Nordic countries are going to be winners in the climate change um, productivity in terms of agricultural yields and, and other things, whereas the most of the population of the world is coming from the global south. And so that's obviously um, setting us up for some pretty bad tensions. Um, and then world population itself, you know, we have, we have, as, as, human species, we've always assumed that there's going to be more people, there's going to be growth economics, all these things. But um, many of the scenarios that are now being looked at were as fertility is, is going down, meaning just families are having less babies as uh, urbanization happens and electrification happens. 
of, uh, of, of countries and different parts of the world, in general, people are having less kids and there's still more kids being, being had in the, the global south, but that's starting to change. The global north is already basically on a negative path. And, um, and so we're seeing um, that not only that we're going to have we're going to peak in population in the next, you know, within the next century. Um, but we're also going to have this uh, this population that is getting older and older um, bef as we peak, and so we're going to have less young people in the in the system. And in Japan, uh, when that happened, um, it kind of tanked the entire economy because you just young people tend to work harder. They tend to spend their money, not save it. Um, they um, they tend to have a lot of the uh, you know new ideas in culture, and so I think these are all things that are we you know, we're often worried about how big the Earth's population is going to get. But I think we should be equally paying attention to what happens on the other side of this, um, because if all of our e economics are growth based, um, and we start to go into a declining population, that's going to be a very different world than the way we started this century. And I think I'll I'll. Uh, I'll just kind of finish up with um, just reminding uh, you all um, that really, if you you know if you added up the thousands of generations before us, um, the dead add up to about a hundred billion people currently living around uh, seven point seven billion. Um, but if you really if you think about the thousands of generations ahead of us, that's six point seven five trillion uh, people that that are the unborn. And how do we give them voice? in the projects that we're working on? How do we design things so that, that the future generations look back at us and go, wow, they, these guys are the people who scattered those acorns on the ground and, um, and then tended to them so that when we needed to solve the unsolvable problem, um, that the resources were there. And I think, um, now, this is a great um, slide that I adapted from uh, Roman Kuznarek's recent book called The, the Good Ancestor. Um, and it's, uh, it's a, a really clarifying way, I think, to think about how we um, are designing for the future. And with that, um, hopefully uh, Denise and I will have a chance to talk over some of these issues and others. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sander. I always love listening to you guys talk about Long Now and, and that work. It seems so incongruous in the middle of Silicon Valley to be looking at you know different timescales in, in the middle of all that hurry, hurry, sell, sell, you know, right? Yeah, well, and, <laughs> and as I, I mentioned, I, I think it was kind of, in a way, a lot of the people who are the founding board were kind of these canaries in the coal mine of, um, of the accelerating culture, and I think they saw some of the pitfalls earlier than than others. So there was a there was a sensitization moment um, that happened in the the mid '90s when uh, Long Now was founded that I think was key. Yeah, I think you're right. And and um, as you know, I'm a huge huge fan of Stewart's. And I was just telling my mom while you were talking. My mom is here in the room with me. She's 88, and I was explaining to her, you know, about Stewart. And, and how amazing he is, all of them really, but particularly him. Um, okay, so we, of course, this is a for a conference about InnerSource, which is about using open source methods inside proprietary companies. And the reason that I started pushing that was mostly a concern about the sustainability of the open source movement. Um, as a community of practice, it requires kind of a commonality of intent, uh, at least at some level, and what I saw happening about 10 years ago was, first of all, open source was starting to emerge as the winner in that war, but also the new kids were showing up and they had different demands, different interests, different, different timescale thoughts. You know, There was a real concern that they weren't earning enough yet and they were just fresh out of school, you know, where we decided that we wanted to do this because we loved it and, and we were willing to work the extra hours because it was, it was a passion project for all of us. And so thinking about sustainability, thinking about the vanishingly small number of people that have managed to make their living working the way that I do and wanting to see that be a more common experience because it's a better way to build software. It gives you time to do things like think about the long-term um, implications of what you're <laughs> right. doing. Indeed, yeah. Right? And so, uh, so anyway, that's why I started talking about InnerSource. 
And I'm going to work backwards through some of what you said. I was really interested in the locks story because one of the things that we run into again and again, and especially in industries like fintech where security is a big deal, um, there's still in some camps a pretty rigid belief that loose lips sink ships and that it's possible to have security through obscurity and that that is sufficient, which right. it blows my mind, you know? <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, and, for uh, sure. I mean, I, the the kind of the trail the trail to where we are now is scattered with the bodies of uh, projects that you know that didn't consider security at their at their at their beginning. I mean, start even with things like email. Um, you know, it was not considered at the beginning, and because it was all it was always thought, well, our project is just this little funny cute thing that we're doing here, and then all of a right. sudden it's taken over the world, and it doesn't have any basic levels of security in it. Yeah, we have that problem with maintainership as well. Um, it's I know you just had Nadia Iqbal. Um, I, I'm tr a little troubled by her work, to tell you the truth, because I think that she came at it from a pure economics perspective without mm -hmm. understanding the sort of underpinnings of the whole thing. And with an assumption that the new kids crop of concerns were, were paramount. Um, but I do think that sustainability is a question. And so my take on it is make more open source developers, make all the developers become open source, effectively make them learn how to collaborate. And we have a better chance of, of finding enough people that are interested in maintenance. Um, you know, the, the paradox there is that the kids that invent stuff, and I'm, I'm dating myself calling everybody a kid, but the, the younger people that invent stuff are usually rabbits. They're interested in the newness. And yep. they are not thinking about maintainability because why would they bother, bother themselves with that, you know? Um, yeah. And it's, a, it's an interesting problem, I think, in software because, you know, often, you know, some of the greatest things are, are made were just, you know, quick, simple hacks um, and then they kind of run away. Um, and the question is, like, would people even do them if they had to build them so carefully that they were ready for future uh, yeah. migrations. Yeah, no, they wouldn't so is the answer. They yeah. <laughs> want to move fast and break things. And, yeah. and so then people have to come along behind and say, no, wait, I'm dependent on this. Let me see how I can make it, you know, stay. I mean, that's sort of what happened with the Linux kernel in a way, right? right? And, yep. and thank God it did because the business was kind of a mess before that. But um, interesting to see some great ideas like Unix sort of make the cut as a concept, but not as a product right. and, and be endlessly refactored for new audiences. I think that's a really interesting trend. Um, no, and also there's also, I mean, there seems to be something kind of in the air too. I mean, I think it's interesting. There's um, there's things like Roman Kersnerik's new book, The Good Ancestor. There's um, uh, Vincent Iolenti who was embedded um, at the, the Finnish um, waste isolation plant for nuclear waste. It's a hundred thousand year facility, he wrote a recent book as well. Um, and then okay. we're seeing projects like Nadia Eggball talking about uh, maintenance of software. And then uh, there's another project called the, Man the Maintainers, which also is kind of codifying a lot of these issues around so all kinds of maintenance. Um, and uh, they, he, they have a new book, um, for, I think it's called The Innovator's Dilemma, which is this problem of like, how do you innovate and also build for maintenance? So I think it's be, maybe worth- Yeah, uh, it, that's gonna to be more. really interesting to look at, I think. Um, I have been following your work, you know, avidly for so long, all of y'all, because I'm sort of drawn to this stuff anyway. You know, I was that kid that wanted to talk to the old people when I was when I was a kid, and because that kind of of wealth of knowledge that gets lost in a single generation because people are dying without handing it over, um, you know, that's a problem. In in software, there was a time when people believed that if they held on to all the secrets they knew, that would mean they were forever employable, right? Mm -hmm. And, and um, so they would obfuscate or, or just refuse to share. And we're sort of, Intersource is partly about breaking that habit and getting people to realize that there's, there is a debt to a larger time scale than the one that you're living in. And mm -hmm. it's worth giving up the information so that, the, so that your life's work doesn't fizzle. Right. You know, um, we were, yeah, my I, husband, go ahead. 
I was going to say, I mean, it's we've seen this kind of transition also happen in, in academics, right, where, um, you know, the kind of publisher par parish model really led to people um, hoarding data and not wanting to share their data. Um, but as the kind of Wikipedia generation has come into, you know, as department heads and things like that, um, and they realize that really the data's most valuable space is in sharing it and connecting it and finding ways of, of having interoperable da data. And so it seems to be a generational shift that's underway, but you know, you have, how do you take away the um, incentives for hoarding data versus sharing it? Um, versus, is it, I think an interesting question in all these realms. And how do you, how do you retain human dignity and privacy when you're sh sharing all the data is another question. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just a, such an interesting time. Maybe every generation feels like they're standing on the precipice of time, but it really feels that way to us, I think. Um, maybe ever since it was possible to destroy the earth, you know, maybe since the nuclear bomb is, is really when that became a thing. But of course, you and Certainly I have lived one of whole them. Yeah, I mean, during the Industrial Revolution, um, you know, several of these revolutionary kind of moments. Um, certainly, you you can read writings from those times where people and the and the transportation revolution, you know, people talking about how the human body could never s handle you know certain speeds like going right. over sixty miles, forty an hour miles an hour, hour. Things, yeah, <laughs> things <laughs> like that. Um, so I think there's there's been these moments, and we're in one of them, and we're in kind of a kind of a, a bit of an autocatalytic and cascading one because of the number of things that are are now becoming possible simultaneously. So um, I'm always interested in like reading in the past uh, when people felt similarly, and, and it certainly was the case. Um, but the question is, is yeah, is now really different and you know one of my favorite definitions of technology is it's all the stuff that doesn't work right yet um and um and so we're in the middle of a time where we have a bunch of stuff that doesn't work right yet but it's in it it's we're using it and you know when electricity was invented and you know people first got it in their houses it was technology right like people would they would right. not work sometimes you'd invite your friends over to show them to turn on the lights um and um and now electricity is was is generally not considered technology except for here in california where we only get it about 10 months out of the year now um yeah. but the um the you know that's, so it's kind of gone reason, it's kind of back back to yeah it's a, a very <laughs> a, a very clear maintenance story and and very much how something could revert back into this idea of, of something that doesn't work right yet um, so, yeah, yeah, I think that's the question of, you know, things like these, all these digital tools that we're using, we, um, you know, some are becoming so underpinned in the internet, like the Linux kernel, that they're, we're, they're almost not technology anymore. Um, they're, they're these, you know, kind of much more slower moving uh, maintenance items. Yeah, probably paved roads were technology at some point, right? For sure. So, yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Well, so one of the things that I worry about as a person trying to help a group of people to see what I see and, and you know, get excited about it and work on it is how to disseminate an idea. And I think you guys have been very creative in your choices of projects that would disseminate your idea, like the mechanical clock and the Rosetta and, and you know, de-extinction of the woolly mammoth. <laughs> pretty, pretty broad spectrum. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the key, I, I, you know, we could have written white papers about long term thinking, we could have made a mantle sized clock that's that could last for a really long time. Um, we, you know, there's all kinds of ways of doing these projects, but the for each one that we do, we try to do something that would capture people's imagination that would, you know, it gives, you know, it gives people the permission to write a story about it, either if it's a press story or even a fictional story and use it as a, as an element. Um, you know, Neil Stevenson wrote Anathem, which kind of about a world of 10,000 year clocks. And so that's, that's really the kind of thing that we want to catalyze. And the only things that we know that have lasted on the timescales that we're talking about are not really artifacts so much they are um their stories and myths and so um if we can if we can create the right myths and the right stories then it becomes this touchstone of uh you know when somebody says well we can't do a project that's that long term they go, well look at these crazy people who did this ten thousand year clock and and if we can inspire someone to just stretch their 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 frame of mind a little bit in their realm then i think we're succeeding 
Yeah, I, I think you might be right about that. Um, I have been very interested in pattern languages um, ever since I started at Sun and Bill Joy handed me Chris Alexander's books and yep. looking at the idea of trying to make sense of of human endeavor through some very narrow lens, like a dictionary of, of architectural elements, right? And so we've been working in the InterSource Commons community on a pattern language for InterSource because unlike open source, open source, you just describe an end state and people aspire to it, you know, in terms of how much transparency and that, that kind of thing. But in InterSource, there we're working against an existing culture that is not supportive of those behaviors. And so we have to figure out how to mitigate, you know, cor correct for slight differences in the way they think about things so that they get to the point of being able to, you know, do this same thing that we all do. And the, a pattern language is the only way I could think of to get at it, come up with all the possible mitigations, make them into a dictionary, give people the opportunity to peruse them and see themselves in those possibilities and decide which ones to implement. You know, does mm -hmm. that sound reasonable to you? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, yes, I mean, I, I would agree with that. I think it's a it's how we, how we inspire people to work on shared projects um, is a is going to be a a problem um, that is society wide. It's not going to be, it's not it's not just it's not just this. I mean, we're seeing it, you know, even as things like you know Facebook and Twitter kind of roll out across the world and and become the de facto place where a lot of cultural um, exchange is happening. That um, that we we don't really have good tools for how to how to work that way where 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 right. we post something and you know it used to be maybe our tribe or our community sees it and reacts to it but now you know there's people with hundreds of millions of, of followers and and um i don't think the human psyche's quite got that that stuff sorted out very well um and and so and I, and that kind of problem resonates within um these communities of you know of practice for things like open source where they might you know you might be building on work that's that's decades old and you're trying to put the mm -hmm. new shiny uh feature on it um and how do you how do you get people excited about about working that way yeah, I feel like the key insight for for open source, and I think it's true for inner source as well, is that it's really about enlightened self-interest. Like if you can't find that link of self-interest and if it doesn't have an enlightened aspect, then you can't make it work, right? right. The, the, it, it, the malevolent instinct doesn't get you there. It's, you know, right, it has to be, there has to be hope in it. And as you know, I've been at this open source thing for a while and we really did not know that it was going to win, <laughs> right? right? We just knew for that sure. we loved it and we wanted to work that way. And so we poured ourselves into it and we got lucky, right? Yeah, I mean, but there, you know, there's definitely infrastructure projects throughout time, you know, whether, you know, sewage projects, you know, are probably, there's a great example of like, who wants to work on sewage, right? Um, but without sewage, like, civilization does not work. And, um, and so it's, there are people who, who did have dedicated their lives to building better sewage systems and there's you know um and and how that works so i think there's there's other examples in any you know, more a, kind of a, a nicer example is just a wa how water systems work and there's some water yeah. systems that are thousands of years old and continuous use um and um and so those were designed in ways that were you know maintainable and understandable um and um and and attracted people enough to keep them going. Um, and I think those are, those may be some good examples to use in the open source world. You know, they're these yeah, kind of un unsexy that. things um, that we all need, right? So how do you, yeah, no, how, how do you find those people? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually funny that you mention it. Um, the most recent update of the software that runs the dike system that keeps um, Amsterdam from being inundated was written by uh, a friend of ours who is deeply steeped in open source. So. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed your talk. I know that our friends are going to enjoy it as well. And as I discussed with you earlier, we'll probably end up releasing the full version of this as a director's cut. And then we'll cut down the original, you know, file to be to fit the time slot that we need. But no we're so grateful that you took the time and thank you. Thank you. 
and I'm looking forward to seeing you at the interval in better times because <laughs> I have some, I have, I have, I just refreshed the scotch, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. You got a full bottle sitting there for it. I have for full you. bottles. In there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll, we'll keep it for you. And look, I very much look forward to um, being able to host people there again soon. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you very much.